Hey Kaylee Winks, welcome back to a brand new episode of the Pink Book or something. I can't remember what I called it. Today we have a slightly you know more 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 deep and insightful story for you all today. It is The Wasteland. Um so it's a bit longer than our normal one, so it will probably just be the this this one story for today. Um, but it, yeah, it's a, it's a long one, so strap yourself in and you know get ready. Grab yourself a cup and some some bickies maybe. And listen as we dive in to another marvellous piece of writing by a completely unknown source. The Wasteland. Prologue. Piles of stuff as far as the eye can see. Broken stuff. Worthless stuff. Unwanted stuff. It hits home, man. <clears throat> Objects. Creatures, unknown substances, a desolate, bleak landscape. No flora for miles, no fauna could brave this deadly, polluted wasteland. Why it came to be, it's a question of a thousand answers. The aftermath of a decade-long war, two opposing sides, a pair of corrupt governments threatening their people and neighbours. That is one answer. The answer. It's the question of what started the battle that goes currently unanswered. Shirtland, the all-mega empire, under a capitalist control, was the king of the continent. An empire stretching over almost half the continent, Shirtland was the boss man and main rival of these lands. They are the most successful country with a GNI of around 172,678, whatever on earth that is. That's like 15,698 pounds. And an empire including over 15 other countries. However, the main rival of Shirtland and the Shirtinium Empire is a communist empire called Mapleland. The rivalry does not come to the fact that one country happens to be capitalist and the other is communist. This is not a propaganda story. No. Mapleland is functioning and flourishing country partly because of it. It is, however, a far smaller empire, seeing as the communist ideology does not support such a vast expanse of territory without troubling the main country of Mapleland. Its small size is also to do with the massive rule of Shirtland, taking up nearly 50% of the continent and ever expanding. Shirtland is currently invaded and taken control of three of Mapleland's countries before the war, and this would only get higher. The main leader of the country, Shirtland, was... Oof. Oh. No. Why? <laughs> Why? Okay. <clears throat> the main leader of the country of Shirtland was Skylar <laughs> Jaden Ivanov. An ambitious, extremely rich and powerful man. He led with an iron fist and was a very caring ruler, despite what the people may believe. Then there was Miss Emily Elaine Patterson, a somewhat more generous, careful ruler. She wanted nothing more than success and unity. That's the first, that's the first chapter. Um, as you can tell, I'm distraught. At the fact that this guy's name is Skylar. That was not meant to happen. 
I deeply apologize for all the trauma I just caused. But, you know, kidly winks, we progress. And so we move on to the next chapter, pre-war. They had just arrived back home from the supermarket. Sarah, a 15-year-old girl, and Sam, a 14-year-old boy, brother to Sarah, were told to take the food into the house. Ah, oh, Sam, my dearest, most wonderful brother, would you be so kind as to... What do you want? Sam asked. Would you be so kind as to turn the radio to frequency five? She said in an almost too endearing manner. I'm holding the milk so Dad doesn't have to. Sam paused. Fine, but on one condition. Go on. You were putting all of the shopping away. He smirked in that stupid, smug way. Nah, I'll just turn it on by myself. Are you sure? He said slowly. Positive. Positive. Yes. Positive. She emphasized. Fine then, you win this time. He lowered his tone. Just make sure to check your sheets tonight. Sam had no idea what he meant by this, and he knew it. Also, I thought you were putting the shopping away. Their mother, Laura, exclaimed. We were, but Sarah keeps enslaving me to do stuff. Oh, yes, because asking someone to turn a dial is the equivalent to torturous non-stop work against your will, she said. Yes. Laura sighed and mumbled. Honestly, where did I go wrong? Ouch, Sam thought. Sarah just laughed and continued to put the bread into the bread bin. Sam felt bad and insulted, so he turned the dial to five. And that was Won't Ever Give You Up by Rick Ashley. You've got to love it. Now, on to the news, the radio presenter said. Oh, Sarah, my dear, turn the volume up. You know these ears don't work as well as they used to. Alan, their father, exclaimed. Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. She changed accents, apparently. Sarah said. <laughs> I said. Can you? I know what you said, Dad. It's just a joke. She sighed and continued packing up. Well, the military of Meepleland have been sighted patrolling the border after President Schuyler stated at his conference that we are looking for more land nearby Shirtland for our economic growth and growth of status. Multiple reports from both Shirtland and Mapleland have stated they have seen Shirtland aircrafts patrolling and doing some recon, the reporter said. Many saw the statement from Mr. Ivanov as a threat and that a new invasion may be underway. In other news, me, 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 Everyone looked at each other, and they looked at their father and husband. Alan had previously been drafted into one of Ivanov's invasions, so either he'd freak out or know what to do. Is this real? Sarah said nervously. Are we all going to die? Sam shouted. It's not confirmed yet. And the president didn't even say he would. Laura said reassuringly. Oh, trust me. He will. Anna said. Whenever he makes one of these statements, he pretends it's all cool and relaxed. 
but he probably already has plans for attack. But where would he even invade? Sarah asked, trembling. Well, there's only one place next to it that he would want, and that is Maypoland. But what about Deshina and Gardo? Sarah asked again. The thing is, if Skylar does go for Maypoland, he will then also own all of the countries previously owned by Maypoland. Alan said dreadingly. That's like, uh, the whole of Loanda. They continued discussing. When the phone started to ring. I'll get it, guys. Alan said, walking over to the phone. Hello? Everyone was silent. Alan talked for a bit. Yes. We just listened to it. He was talking to someone. About the newscast. Mm hmm Yes. We'll check in on you. He put the phone down. It was my mother and father. Granddad and Grandma, Sarah and Sam both exclaimed. They're all right. They just wanted to check in. The day continued as normal. The newscast was still in the back of everyone's mind. Till they went to bed. Are you sure everything's fine? Sam asked, impishly. Everything is fine. Don't worry yourself. Just go to sleep, Laura said, turning the lights off. They all went to sleep, and did so for hours, till the phone rang again. It's the end of the next chapter, Kidley Winks. You need to get a refill in your jar of water. Feel free to do so now. Hydration is, after all, very important. You know, you need a well-hydrated voice to do such a exciting job as my own. <coughs> Big, clear, strong voice. We will begin momentarily. Until then, I'm sure I'll dub over some music or something. Alright, Kidley Winks. Welcome back. 
we can now start our second chapter. Technically third. Whoa! Okay, everybody, change of plans, Laura said nervously. She ran into each room, turning on the lights. Shirtland had started an invasion of Mapleland. The Mapleland were quick to retaliate, so the country was being evacuated. What's happening? Sarah asked, startled by the sudden awakening. We need to leave now, Alan said, whilst hauling bags down the stairs without explanation. They headed to the car, the faint sounds of sirens coming from the main town, roaring jets soared overhead as they got into the car. The motorway was packed. Cars, as far as the eye could see, Sam and Sarah still didn't know what was happening, but they were afraid. Seriously, why won't you tell us where we're going? Sarah asked, frightened. Yeah, where are we going? Sam responded. We've got an evacuation order, Alan replied. A great leader has threatened his people again and invaded Mapleland. So where are we going? She asked again. Wherever. The military people tell us to. That's great. Really splendid, she remarked sarcastically. They're just trying to protect us. Well, by throwing us into an atomic war. Who says it's going to be? I think, actually, that's quite enough. Just concentrate on where you're going, Laura said. They were all silent for the two and a half hours they were on the motorway until they reached a tunnel. They stopped and a tall man in a camouflage uniform approached them. May I please have all of yours, ID? The man asked. And what exactly do you need ID for? Alan asked, aggravated. To check if you're approved to go through the tunnel. The man seemed very fed up. I don't think so. So I'll just... Alan was cut off. Just hand them our passports. I knew we'd need them. Laura added. Alan reluctantly handed the passports with a scowl. And they drove into the tunnel. It was dark very dimly lit, around the signs leading to a temporary safety facility. The facility was a large bunker with a rail station for the transport of people to a safer location. Not 15 minutes into the tunnel, the lights went out. The ground shook temporarily as a loud bang echoed through the huge tunnel. After the first noise, Smaller, more sporadic noises followed on. They stopped the car, turned the lights on. What was that? Sarah whispered. The pure terror reflected in her tone. They were all silent. All the noise stopped. Everything was quiet. Survival. It's another chapter, by the way. I also can't decide on an accent for Sarah, and it's really funny, so I'm going to stick with it. Whatever it was, it was awful. Even inside the tunnel, you could hear the roars of engines, jets, and explosives. Alan floored it to the bunker until they stopped. The tunnel had collapsed halfway through, when all of a sudden, it was very hot. They peered through a windscreen and through a hole in the roof. A cloud, not just any cloud, a mushroom cloud. Atomic bombs 
fleets of aircraft and armoured vehicles shooting and exploding. Destruction. They stared in awe. They didn't realise a group of soldiers behind them. They knocked on the window. They turned, startled. Come with us now, the ARMS leader said. The AR, the, 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 the ARMS stood for Armed Rescue Military Service. It was a division of the Shirtland Rescue Service and Special Forces. They specialise in extreme life or death apocalyptic situations. The two, Alan asked, shivering. Somewhere safe, they replied. And we're safe, Alan exclaimed. They gave a stern look of disappointment. The family obliged and stepped out. It was sweltering hot. Their skin was peeling off because of this. They were thrown into a truck and they started to drive. After a nerve-wracking one and a half hours of driving, they stopped. They were escorted out and into a large hangar. The sky was black with smoke and ash, the air stale and the concrete and corrugated sheet metal that built the hangar was dismal shades of grey. They entered the hangar and it was filled with crates, vehicles and very few survivors. They were taken to a cubicle where they were medicated and their burns were treated. You will stay, you will stay in cubicle, I fall, the doctor said. Thank you very, very much, Laura said. It traversed into the cramped corridors. One, two, three, four. They were there. So they got unpacked. They settled down. It was very hospitable. They felt safe, regardless to the comings and goings of never returning soldiers. The constant screeching of bombs and shells. Days turned into weeks, turned into months, turned into years. Everyone was restless. The walls rusted, but the bombs continued. The lack of socialisation and things to do drove them up the walls. When are we leaving this place? Sarah shouted. If only we could ask Alan, Laura said. We have any time in the foreseeable future until we leave. Someone in a corridor said. You don't care what it takes. I want to be out of this stupid place. Laura was extremely offended by this remark. The only reason we're still alive is because of this stupid place. Little did Sarah know, her wish would soon come true the following evening. They all went to bed and something catastrophic happened. Right, kiddly winks. It's the end of this chapter. There is... It's the last chapter. So I, I don't know why there are chapters, it's not a very long story. But, you know, this is where it gets really scary. So, if you don't want to get your socks blown off, then you know, grab the closest person next to you, Cuddle up tight with them. Get under a blanket together. Make sure you're hugging each other real tight for this one. Because you're going to need it. Crikey. So, here we go. Keely Winks. The final chapter. The Wasteland. Sarah woke up in a pile of rubble. 
coughing. She screamed at the blood pouring from her skull. She screamed for help. No one answered other than her empty echo. There was nothing bleak grey and sky for miles. Suddenly, Sarah panicked. Where was her family? She frantically pulled any rock and rubble, only to find the scorched, obliterated bodies of what was her mum and brother. Sarah was mortified at the sight of the mutilated corpses. She cried for hours until she passed out again. Sarah woke up much calmer and decided she needed to get her act together. She fashioned a house out of the rubble and created a fire with the charcoal and wood from the hangar. As time passed, minutes to hours to days, she realised she was going to need food. She scoured the empty land. Her blood ran cold. There was only one thing. One thing that was edible. She said her final goodbyes and sliced them into portions. As the tears passed, she was done. There was nothing left of them. However, instead of looking for food, she sat. She knew it was over. She wasn't done. But she knew. And she waited for her demise. Turns out, this was the penultimate chapter, not the last chapter. So, here we go. Keely Winks. Final chapter. Sorry, I had to compute my head for a second. <laughs> Ready? Right. Uh, I'll be right. Aftermath. Not more than a couple of days later, the war was over. Maple Lund had won. Their soldiers went on a mission looking for survivors and found something horrible. Bare skeletons, a rubbled shack and the corpse of an emaciated girl. It was sad, but a valuable lesson that Mapleland and Shirtland learned that day. If their decisions affect more than themselves, but the people around them and life as they knew it. After this discovery, they signed an agreement of war. War was no more, but the amount of but no amount of laws and papers would change the past. The end. So, Kiddlywinks, what did you think of that story? I think it was a good change from the previous episode um it's again morals got good good morals obviously kiddly winks you're not going to go to war and kill people right but it's true your actions will affect those around you so keep that in mind please Tell me in the comments what you thought of this story and what lessons you learned from it. I think it was a good change, good change in scene, a nice long story for us all to enjoy. And with that said, um, I think we'll leave it here. So until next time, Kiddlywinks, so long. <laughs>